the mother of Methodism, Susanna Wesley, played a crucial role in the life and upbringing of her children, specifically John and Charles Wesley, who are considered to be the founders of the Methodist movement. Susanna is both a matriarch and a saint. In the words of Eliza Clark, although she never preached a sermon or published a book or founded a church, she is known as a mother of Methodism. Why? Because two of her sons, John Wesley and Charles Wesley, as children, consciously or unconsciously, apply the example and teachings and circumstances of their home life. There is no doubt that without Susanna Wesley, there would be no Methodist church. So join us today on this special Mother's Day episode of the Methodical Methodist Podcast as we explore the mother of Methodism, Susanna Wesley. Hello and welcome to the Methodical Methodist Podcast, a podcast where we talk about why the church is still relevant for us today as we explore themes connected to religion, politics, pop culture, faith, and yes, even the church. Together we can find out what it means to live into the mission of the church by making disciples. Now, let's get methodical. Hello everyone, I am your host, the Reverend Andrew Lay, and I am excited to spend this time on the podcast today. If you like the show, hope that you might take a minute to subscribe, rate, and write a review for the podcast. It helps to boost the show and make it to where more people can find it. You can also find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash methodicalpod, and you can find me on Instagram as well. My handle is at methodicalpod, so be sure to check me out. All right, so let's jump into today's special Mother's Day episode of the Methodical Methodist Podcast. Susanna Ainsley Wesley was born on January the 20th, 1669, to Dr. Samuel Ainsley and Mary White Ainsley. She was the 25th of 25 total children, which is remarkable in itself. Um, Her father was a prominent nonconformist minister in London, England, and nonconformist just simply means that he did not fall in line with the established Church of England. He was of the Puritan persuasion. And at the young age of 13 years old, Susanna made a pros and cons list of whether to be a Puritan or a member of the Church of England. So you can see just at a, even at a young age, she's very smart. And ultimately, she made the decision to leave her father's church and become a member of the Church of England instead. And I think that this shows how smart she was and how much of an independent woman she really was. Uh, She was allowed, even at home, to jump in debates at the dinner table with her father and his associates. And as a teenager, this really sharpened her skills in debate and opened her up to a different way of thinking. Unlike most women, Susanna could read and write. In fact, she was very well educated, which was pretty rare at the time. She was Uh, very methodical in her studies, although unfortunately she was not able to attend university because they did not admit women during this time. Despite this, she still became very knowledgeable at philosophy, logic, anatomy, French, Greek, and Latin. And Susanna really became a theologian in her own right. She wrote extensive commentaries on the Apostles' Creed and the Lord's Prayer and the Ten Commandments. Susanna married her husband, Samuel Wesley, on November the 11th, 1688. Samuel was 26 years old, and Susanna was 19, and they were married for 46 years. They had first met when she was 12 years old, and he was 19 years old. He was in college, and Samuel had come to visit Susanna's father. And Susanna and Samuel bonded over their interest in the Church of England. Both of them 
had grown up with Puritan parents, and they kind of saw the tides changing. And after Samuel finished seminary, the couple were married, and um, of their 46 years of marriage, they spent 39 of those years in Epworth, England, where Samuel served as rector of the church there called St. Andrews. It was in the Church of England. So they did officially make that switch over to the Church of England. The Wesley couple had 19 children uh, total in the span of 20 years, so that's a very quick turnaround. Uh, the boys were Samuel Jr., John, and Charles, and the girls were Amelia, Susanna, Mary, Mehedabel, Anne, Martha, and Kezia. Unfortunately, nine of these children died as infants. Four of the children who died were twins. And a maid accidentally smothered one child, which is just horrible, and, and it crippled her for the rest of her life. And at Susanna's death, only eight of her children were still alive. So she is, is clearly a woman who dealt with a lot of trials and heartache in her life. I think it is especially fitting to talk about Susanna on Mother's Day, considering the influence that she had on her children. So I just want to give a quick shout out to my incredible mother, Janan Lay. I love you very much. Also, I'm thankful for my sister, Emily, who is an amazing mother to her children as well. And I'm glad to say that here very soon, I'm going to have a wonderful mother-in-law, Lee Clark. And so happy Mother's Day to all of you. And I hope that you all have an opportunity to thank your mothers and all the women who have made you the people that you are today. There is no doubt that Susanna Wesley was truly an incredible mother. She was in charge of the early education of her children, and she instituted an hour each week to spend with each of her children at home. And she actually wrote uh, about this to her husband who was away at the time, and this is what she said. I am a woman, but I am also the mistress of a large family. And though the superior charge of the souls contained in it lies upon you, yet in your long absence, I cannot but look upon every soul you leave under my charge as a talent committed to me under a trust. I'm not a man nor a minister, yet as a mother and a mistress, I felt I ought to do more than I had yet done. I resolved to begin with my own children in which I observe the following method. I take such a proportion of time as I can spare every night to discourse with each child apart. On Monday I talk with Molly, on Tuesday with Hetty, Wednesday with Nancy, Thursday with Jackie, better known as John Wesley, Friday with Patty, Saturday with Charles. It's clear that Susanna taught her children lessons that they carried out throughout their entire lives. Susanna would spend six hours a day homeschooling her children. On the very first day that they would start homeschooling, they were required to learn the entire alphabet all in one day. And apparently all of her children were able to do this except for two of them. She equipped the older children to teach the younger children. And on the fifth birthday, Every child was taught to read. She made sure her daughters could read before they could sew. And she required all of her children to actually read out loud. And the children were encouraged to ask questions and engage in dialogue. However, Susanna had very strict rules by which she expected all of her children to live by. And I think that these rules contributed to the way that, that John and Charles Wesley uh, had this methodical way of doing things in the Methodist movement. These household bylaws were important to how Susanna raised her children. And when they turned a year old, they were taught to fear the rod and to cry softly, which I think is hilarious. Like, you can cry, but just cry softly. Don't cry very loudly. <laughs> and, and, and it's interesting that she said this because apparently she really didn't have to spank her kids very often. Um, so it's kind of interesting that she uh, used this as one of her big uh, phrases. 
her bylaws included some really important life lessons. And so I want to take a minute and go through those. The first one is the benefit of honesty. She writes, Whoever was charged with a fault, of which they were guilty, if they would ingenuously confess it and promise to amend, should not be punished. This rule prevented a great deal of lying and would have done more if one in the family would have observed it. (laughs) So I I feel like that's a good rule, you know, be honest. If you are honest and confess and amend, then you don't really get punished for it. I think that's fair. I like that rule. Um, The second rule is really about consistency. Um, If one of her children was caught breaking the rules or disobeying her orders and they needed to be punished, she was consistent in that. She wouldn't punish one child for that punishment and not the other. She was consistent in how she dealt with that. She was very fair in how she doled out her punishments. The third rule has to do with how she offered a clean slate, and I love this one. Um, If she punished a child and they were remorseful, then she would not hold it over that child. She kind of followed that passage of Scripture, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. So there was no like, remember that time you did this? I can't believe you did it. It was was gone. She would wipe that slate clean and you had a fresh start with her, which I think is just a remarkable way of of parenting, of doing those things. Uh, The fourth rule is about, again, consistency. Just as she was consistent in how she disciplined her children, she was also uh, consistent in offering praise and rewards for obedience when her children exhibited good behavior. So she was consistent in how she kind of rewarded her children as well. Susanna talks about her fifth rule as she writes, If ever any child performed an act of obedience or did anything with an intention to please, though the performance was not well, yet the obedience and intention should be kindly accepted. And I kind of, this is kind of how I take this. Um, Susanna kind of gave her children an A for effort. Like if they honestly and earnestly tried to do something and they were practicing good behavior and they were obeying all of her rules and they were doing something that just wasn't like done well, <laughs> like they were bad at it, um, she still was very kind to them about that. Um, She kindly accepted that, um, gave them, in other words, an A for effort. That's kind of how I took that rule, um, which I I love that. I think that's really cool. Uh, The sixth rule talks about the importance of respecting others. Uh, Susanna taught her children to respect really other people and their property, and she saw really a lack of that respect, specifically when it came to the property of others. Um, And she saw that that was a common problem in the larger society. And I think that's a lesson that all of us can uh, live by even now as well. Susanna's seventh rule uh, taught her children the importance of being true to one's word. As she stated, a gift once bestowed, and so the right passed away from the donor, be not resumed. In other words, keep your word. Follow through with the promises that you make. Don't say that you're going to do something and not do it. I mean, how many parents have told us that that before? That's such a, a mother rule right there. I love that. And so, you know, I, I think a lot of parents, as I'm thinking about Susanna Wesley and all of her rules, I think a lot of parents right now might really appreciate Susanna, kind of knowing that she was able to raise so many children practically by herself Especially, you know, during this COVID-19 crisis, I think parents might find an appreciation for somebody who can educate and raise 10 children all under the same roof. It's, it's really remarkable. I'm, I'm finding it really interesting seeing uh, parents and children on, on Facebook and on social media and seeing some of kind of the funny things that are going on. And I know um, it's, a, it's a time that's difficult for a lot of parents, kind of trying their patience, um, having to... to play teacher and educate their kids in this very, very strange time. So I think we can all kind of see how Susanna was really a remarkable woman. You know, even though it was the 1700s, I think it was still hard, Um, still a lot of challenges, perhaps even more challenges. She didn't have the luxury that luxuries that some of us have today. You know, she didn't have a, a dishwasher and a washing machine. 
and, and all of those things. So I think that's really, really cool to see um, what kind of mother she was, especially facing some of the hardships that she did, especially losing children. I don't know. I thought that was kind of a neat uh, comparison uh, to how she parented today and how parents may be experiencing uh, what that might be like a little bit um, during this COVID-19 crisis as well. Now, not only did Susanna teach her children important life skills, but she was also a crucial figure in her children's spiritual lives as well. She inquired about the spiritual life of each child, and she taught them in a very methodical way. She would often ask her children this question, How is it with your soul? That is a a question that shows that she really did care about the spiritual health and formation of her children. And I think we can see how that question kind of bleeds over into the Methodist movement of, of John and Charles Wesley. This is a question that they would ask their preachers, how is it with your soul? This led, I think, eventually to the classes and bands of small groups that the Wesley brothers instituted for the Methodists um, in Britain and in America. So I think we can definitely see the influence that Susanna had on the Wesley brothers and on the Methodist movement just right there alone. Something that, that John and Charles definitely took with them from their childhood. In a letter she wrote on July 24th, 1732, later on in her life, she reminisced about some of this spiritual education that she shared with her kids, saying this, The children of this family were taught, as soon as they could speak, the Lord's Prayer, which they were made to say at rising and bedtime constantly. Susanna was a very spiritual person, and this had a big influence on her kids. In fact, John Wesley famously said, I learned more about Christianity from my mother than from all the theologians in England. So that shows you not only how much John looked up to his mom, but also how brilliant she was. It kind of reminds me of the story of these four preachers who came together, and they were all talking about the different translations of the Bible, and they were talking about which one was their favorite. One preacher said, well, I like the King James Version because it's it's so beautiful, it's so eloquent. I love the language of that translation. The second preacher said, well, my favorite translation of the Bible has to be the the original Greek and Hebrew because it's the original text. You know, that's, that's my favorite um, version of the Bible. The third preacher said, well, I like the NIV, the New International Version, because it's the translation that my congregation can understand the most. And then the fourth preacher was silent, didn't say anything. And after a few moments, one of the other preachers asked him, well, what, what's your favorite translation of the Bible? And the preacher paused for a minute and said, my favorite translation of the Bible has to be my mother's. And the other four preachers kind of paused for a minute, and they said, well, oh, we didn't know your mother wrote a translation of the Bible. That's, that's amazing. And the preacher said, no, she didn't write a version of the Bible, but she lived it. And I think we can see that same sentiment in the way that Susanna lived out her faith. We see that in the quote that John Wesley shared, that he learned more about Christianity from his mother, from the way that she lived her life, than any theologian in England. Apparently, Susanna would do this thing when she needed to pray. She would sit down in her kitchen, and she would lift up her apron over her head. And if the kids came into the kitchen and saw that Mom had her apron on over her head, that meant that they should leave her alone because she was praying. You know, I think, again, that really shows how dedicated she was as a spiritual leader in her household. And it's really no doubt that Susanna really was the spiritual leader in the house because she was really the one who raised all of the children. Her husband, Samuel, was a a great person, and uh, we should probably give him more credit, but he was also kind of very, he was kind of foolish. He was thrown into debtor's prison twice twice. 
because he just made some very poor financial decisions. And that was obviously a big strain on Susanna. He would also leave for six to eight months at a time. He was very rarely around. And in addition to all of these obstacles that Susanna had to deal with, you know, raising kids on her own and dealing with the financial struggles that her husband were put was putting on this family, on top of all of that, their house in Epworth burned down not once, but twice. In 1709, while the entire Wesley family was asleep, somebody came and set their house on fire, and Samuel was convinced that it was someone in his own congregation who didn't like him. Turns out that a lot of people did not really care for Samuel. But the house burned so quickly that the Wesley family barely made it out alive. But when they got out, they realized that their son John was still inside the house. And so Samuel tried to go back in and get him, but it was too late. The house was already engulfed in these huge flames. So Samuel gets down on his knees and he starts to pray and commends John's life to God's care. But then out of nowhere, one of the townspeople saw John standing next to the upstairs window. And so some men got together, climbed up on one of the man's shoulders, and they pulled John down out of the house before the roof collapsed. And John's mother, Susanna, believed that God had saved her son for some special purpose. Susanna quoted Zechariah 3, 2 by calling John a brand plucked from the fire. And over time, John also believed that God had spared him for this great purpose as well. One time when Samuel was gone in London, which again was not uncommon, he sent a temporary replacement to take over his priestly duties in Epworth. And he was not very well liked. He was not very effective. And he didn't really care much for the people either. So people stopped going to church. And Susanna had been starting a Bible study at her home for her children because she was unhappy with the level of spiritual formation that they were getting from hearing this temporary preacher. And so she started this Bible study in her home. And people found out about it, and they stopped attending church, and they started attending this Bible study instead. And within a month or two, there were 200 people expanding out into the yard who were coming to hear Susanna's Bible study. And really, it wasn't a Bible study. I mean, it was, it was church. She was basically preaching. And people stopped going to church altogether and just started going to Susanna's house instead. And Samuel's replacement got very upset, as you can imagine. And so he wrote a letter and sent that letter to Samuel explaining the situation. And then Samuel wrote to his wife, Susanna, and told her that it was illegal for women to preach and she was to stop immediately. And so Susanna writes back and she essentially says, these people are needing some spiritual guidance. They are needing some spiritual formation, and so if you are going to tell me to stop, then you're going to have to make me, and then you're going to have to answer to God for this, because if people fall away because of this, this is on you. The blood is on your hands. And so, of course, after that letter, Samuel never said another word about it. And so, as you can see, this couple kind of had a rocky relationship, and I think we've seen examples of that, of that already. But there's a story about when they had this one argument about who the rightful king was. Samuel was an Orangeman and supported King William of Orange as the rightful king of England, but Susanna was a Jacobite, and she supported King James II as the rightful king. And one day after Samuel had prayed in family worship for good King William, Susanna did not say amen at the end of his prayer. And Samuel was very aware of the deafening silence, and so he left the house shouting, if we must have two kings, we must have two beds. And there's a rumor that Susanna quickly replied with a simple, okay. <laughs> so we can see how this was a point of tension in their household, 
But this upset Samuel so much that he actually left home and stayed away from home for several months. But when he finally returned home, they were able to reconcile their differences, and nine months later, John Wesley was born. After Samuel passed away, Susanna made the decision to move to London and become more involved in the Methodist movement that her sons had fostered. And she continued to guide and influence and encourage her sons and all of her children during this time. And there was one occasion where John Wesley was gone and there was nobody available to preach the sermon to this gathered congregation. And so they were waiting and waiting for John to arrive. And finally, one of Wesley's lay helpers, Thomas Maywell, stepped up into the pulpit and just simply shared what was on his heart. And it ended up just being this very passionate and moving sermon. When John Wesley finally arrived, the service was already over and everybody had already gone home. John heard that a layman had taken liberties to preach behind the pulpit. And so John took offense to this. But then Susanna, who was present for that service, warned John. She said, you know, God might be behind this. God might be working through this person. She spoke very highly of Thomas Maywell's sermon. And John Wesley, like a good son, went along with his mother. And because of this, he began sending out more lay ministers, both far and wide. In addition to all this, we see examples of John allowing women to exhort and share a testimony. In other words, John allowed some women to preach. And there's no doubt that this was because of the influence of his mother, who he had once seen share the gospel to 200 people from her kitchen in Epworth. Susanna spent the last years of her life staying with her son John at the foundry, which was a Methodist meeting place in London. One author describes this saying, John was now able to provide for her, and his apartment became her home for the rest of her life. While living with John, she was undoubtedly as well supplied with the necessities of life as at any time since she left her father's home 50 years earlier. Susanna would attend John's services there at the meeting house, And on July 1742, John received a letter telling him that his mother was nearing death. So John rode on horseback to London and found her, quote, on the borders of eternity. But she had no doubt or fear, nor any desire but to depart and to be with Christ. I think it's fitting that several of her children were by her side at her death because she loved and cared for her children despite all the obstacles of her life. It's clear that John had a very close relationship with her, and that relationship was very important to him. John describes his mother's last moments saying, Her look was calm and serene, and her eyes fixed upward, while we commended her soul to God. Susanna Wesley died on July 23rd, 1742, at the age of 72. She was buried at Bunhill Fields in London. And if there was a third founder of Methodism, I would venture to say it would be Susanna Wesley. She was an intelligent woman who influenced and cared for her children. And without her, there would be no Methodist church. As one biographer says, We may all rejoice in the wealth of Christian song made available in the hymns composed by Charles, as well as in the mastery evangelistic career of John, culminating in the organizing of the Methodist Church. But although certain of these abilities were derived from their father, Samuel, it was especially from their mother, Susanna. There is no doubt that Susanna influenced all of her children, but especially John and Charles, who went on to lead this revival that spread across England, spread over to America, and eventually made its way around the world. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Methodical Methodist Podcast. 
If you have enjoyed this show, I hope you might consider heading on over to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leave a review of the show. It is very much appreciated. And until next time, stay methodical.